Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Though the weather recently has been cool in many parts of the country, the heat uh, of the summer will soon be here. And tonight, we'll be discussing all the different ways heat stress impacts not only the cow, but also the calf she's carrying. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts for The Real Science Exchange. I see that Dr. Jeff Dahl has joined us at the pub tonight. This week's conversation started with a webinar presentation just a few weeks ago. Dr. Dahl from the University of Florida was part of the Real Science Lecture Series on May 4th. If you'd like to watch the presentation, just go to balchemanh.com slash real science and scroll down to the past webinar list. Welcome to the exchange, Jeff. Uh, what's in your glass tonight? Thanks, Scott. Really a pleasure to be here. So I am drinking a uh, Uruguayan Tanat uh, in uh, honor of my guest who nice. is originally from Uruguay. Uh, it's a nice red. It's uh, fairly bold, but it has a nice smooth finish. So uh, that's probably a good description even of my guest. Ah, excellent. So you mentioned your guest. Uh, would you mind introducing who that is? Sure. Uh, this is Dr. Amena Laporta, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Animal and Dairy Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And uh, Jimena and I have uh, worked together. She was previously on the faculty here at the University of Florida, and we have uh, done quite a bit of work uh, together in the area of heat stress uh, of the dry cow and also uh, more recently the effects on the calf that that animal is carrying. Excellent. Uh, Humana, uh, welcome to the Real Science Exchange. Um, what are you drinking tonight first? And then can you tell us a story about uh, your, your time working with Jeff? I am drinking. Uh, thank you for the invitation first. And I am drinking an old-fashioned and a real one. With brandy. Yes. So thank you, Stephanie, for arranging that. <laughs> um, a story about Jeff. I don't know where to start. I have so many, but they're all great. Uh, it's been a real pleasure working with him. Um, I, I knew Jeff uh, just being a lactation biologist, you know, he's working the photo period and everything. And in 2014, he actually hired me at the University of Florida, so we started working together uh, in the heat stress uh, research, and it's been a real pleasure. We have shared, you know, we shared a lab, we shared postdocs, students, and it's been really fun. Uh, I think um, our most interesting aspect is that we get along really well. We have kind of the same sense of humor in a way that not a lot of people get. We also uh, have fun, so that's, that's really important. Well, excellent. Well, glad to have you here tonight. And I'll, I'll say the old fashioned seems to be the popular order here, usually here at the Real Science Exchange. Dr. Zimmerman, our trusty co-host, is back with us. Clay, now that summer's almost here, um, you having anything different in your glass? I actually am. I'm, I have a hard cider, but in honor of the warm weather, it's a watermelon cider. Watermelon cider. Okay. So if, if this bottle's empty by the end, you'll know it was good. <laughs> Excellent. I'm expecting maybe a, a milkshake one of these days. Does, does Angry Orchard make a milkshake? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Scott, yeah. what are you drinking tonight? Oh, thanks for asking, Clay. I've got something very unique. I, I've, I've, I've dispensed with the bourbon this time. Uh, I'm drinking a red beer in honor of uh, my brother Rex, who was working at the Beartooth Ranch in Montana. I went out to visit him one time, and he introduced me to to red beer. This this particular one is made by Bud Light, and it's called Chilada. So it's it's very interesting. Uh, would recommend it if you ever get a chance. It's basically beer mixed with uh, tomato juice, believe it or not. So. Quite tasty and, and a bit summery. So there you go. I do recommend the Uruguayan Tanat that Jeff is having. It's really, really good. So. It's a good one. We'll have to we'll have to take that down then. Excellent. We'll put it in the show notes so everybody can get it. So excellent, Jeff. Let, let's get started by, by defining heat stress. What point does it start impacting the animal's health and performance? I mean, cows, just like every other animal, has a, a sort of a thermal comfort zone, right? That's a range of temperatures where they're comfortable. And if you go too low, they're going to be cold stressed. If you get above that, they're going to be heat stressed. 
Um, typically, we don't use absolute temperature uh, as an indicator because there are other factors that are going to influence the um, ability of an environment to cause heat stress, particularly humidity. And I bring that up just because I live in a hot and humid environment. And a matter of fact, in the summer in Florida, it won't get as hot as it might in a lot of the continental U.S. You get much hotter than we do in absolute temperature. But the killer for us is the humidity. And so when you combine the temperature and the humidity, what has uh, evolved is a temperature humidity index. And typically for lactating cows, we tend to think that as about 68 if we move above a temperature humidity index of 68, um, those cows are going to start to experience heat stress. Um, dry cows, we had been using that number, but we've got some uh, new information that suggests that it might be a little higher than that, which makes sense because those cows are going to be consuming less feed. There's less heat of nutrient metabolism. They're just producing less heat. So they've, they've got an easier time um, to a certain extent with their uh, environment. But we have to always remember that, you know, dry cows do get heat stressed and they will do things like reduce their intake and they will have some pretty profound negative impacts on their next lactation, but also on the calf. Hmm. So, so that uh, CHI that Jeff was talking uh, about for dry cows, it's uh, 77 according to our calculations. So quite different from lactating cows. We've also done some work in calves, and uh, those uh, breaking points are even lower. They are about 66, 67 for respiration rate and rectal temperature for the calves. So that's some interesting work that we have been doing in, in Florida. So it's very interesting. In terms of, in terms of when they're going to be heat stressed, um, you can take a temperature, you can do rectal temperatures. We have sort of looked at respiration rate as our indicator. And um, across a number of studies now, and this is with dry cows, if they get above 61 for a respiration rate, they're heat stressed. And the more that increases, the more severe the heat stress is that those animals are under. But it's actually not a, it's not a real high respiration rate. You can certainly walk into a lot of barns and see cows at that respiration rate. So they will get heat stressed at a fairly low sort of temperature and humidity. So how good of a, uh, an indicator is rectal temperature? I recall that you, you, you mentioned that in some of your research. Can they be heat stressed and still not show an elevation in rectal temps? Um, usually there'll be some. It's whether you can discriminate it or not. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why at least from, from my perspective, on the farm, when I'm just walking around pens, I think I'd rather use something like respiration rate because I can do it without bothering the cows. And we know that if we get them up moving around, even the tamest of cows, when we go to take a rectal temperature, they're going to jump up and move around and that can mm -hmm. sort of influence their their temperature as well. So I, I just like to be able to observe a group of cows and rather than taking a rectal temperature, use that respiration rate to give me an indication of how hot they might be. So that's kind of uh, the, the type of work that we have been doing recently to try to estimate uh, the, mm -hmm. the heat stress uh, indicators, environmental indicators and animal-based indicators uh, that don't require, you know, getting in contact with the animal and trying to figure out a way, an easy way and more precisely determine uh, heat stress without getting in, touch, in contact with the animal. So that, that's very helpful for, from a producer standpoint. So that's kind of our objective with those studies. Yeah, we Chef? even looked at it in um, cows out on pasture. And it, it's interesting when we have cows in the barn versus out on pasture at night in the summer, um, we do see some recovery uh, in those animals, even at a high THI, uh, but the sort of negative of them being without shade during the day and the increase that you see in temperature then really overwhelms, I think, any benefit yeah. that we get from them being outside um, and, and not allowed to have access to active cooling. 
Yeah, I think we observed like respiration rates of up to one thirty uh, at noon. So that's that's pretty tough on them on pasture. So now, as I recall. Jeff, I was looking at your presentation again uh, today in preparation for the podcast. And, and for the listeners out there, um, even if you listen to the, the, the webinar already, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it again, uh, because I learned an awful lot uh, the second time around. There's just some missing nuggets in there that I missed. So I'd recommend going back and, and listening to that again. But you had broken your uh, presentation down into three primary parts. One is the impact um, on the cow, the impact on the calf. And then you kind of uh, dove into the economics. Uh, let's start with uh, the cow. What, what are some of the things, uh, the, the significant things that you're seeing that heat stress does to the performance uh, of the uh, gestating cow? Yeah. So when the animals are actually in the dry period, um, you know, we don't see a whole lot from the sort of metabolic perspective. Um, so they will have a drop in their intake, but if we look at, for example, insulin concentrations, glucose, uh, NEFAs, we don't see a whole lot going on there in terms of the comparison to lactating cows, where we do see some of those, those change, um, and, and other folks have, have worked on that quite extensively. Um, where we do see significant impacts are on mammary growth. And so, you know, the dry period is a time when we're seeing sort of loss of senescent tissue in that mammary gland, and we're seeing regrowth and preparation for that next lactation. And our observation is that all of those processes are going to be favored by cows being cooled versus animals being heat stressed. So when they're heat stressed, they're going to have lower proliferation of the mammary gland, of the mammary tissue. So you're setting yourself up for less capacity for milk production in that next lactation. There's not an effect on the loss of cells, at least as we move into the dry period, but it does seem like there may be some subtle effects early on and allowing for sort of clearance of those older cells that then makes way for those newer cells to, to grow in and, and develop for that next lactation. And that persists then into the next lactation, that capacity for uh, greater uh, milk yield. Um, we see that at more of the tissue level when we look at alveolar number, there's gonna be an increase again, indicating an increase in capacity for milk production in those cows that were cooled versus those cows uh, that were heat stressed. And the other area that's impacted is uh, immune function. So we will see during the um, during the dry period when cows are heat stressed that they have a, a reduced uh, ability to proliferate white blood cells. They've got a reduced ability to respond to, um, you know, when we did it, it was just an innocuous antigen. It was essentially egg white that we vaccinated cows with just to get an idea of how they mount an immune response. And we observed that the cows that were heat stressed had a lower response. And that is important, obviously, because we do a lot of vaccinating and dry cows. And so if that heat stress is limiting their ability to respond, then we may be setting them up for bigger problems as they move into that next lactation. Um, a lot of the effects that we see, though, are just resultant of what was happening during the dry period. And they actually show up in that next lactation. And the cows that were um, heat stressed typically are going to produce eight. 10 pounds a day less than the cows that were cooled. And that persists for the entire lactation when we followed it out. Um, it also doesn't matter, it seems, when we heat stress the cows. So we've done it early, we've done it late in the dry period. Um, they all seem to have the same sort of response that diminished capacity for milk production in the next lactation. So Jeff, I you know, I've always been surprised when you ran the study looking at when to apply the cooling during the dry period. Mm -hmm. It has to be present the whole dry period. Can you can you maybe explain that again? Sure. Uh, so the the process of of sort of that that tissue growth, that mammary growth, um, you know, it, it's always ongoing. And when we stop 
essentially lactation. When we dry the cows off, that's, as I interpret it, a signal to them to go through this sort of regenerative process. And it's not just that, oh, a bunch of cells die off and then new cells appear. It's more of, we think, a sequential process where we're going to get clearance of some of those senescent cells early in the dry period, which then sort of sets the foundation for increased proliferation as the dry period advances. And then eventually we're going to get them to be sort of stimulated um, when they go through lactogenesis to produce milk. And so when cows are heat stressed, there's going to be effects on that early response. So during the evolution sort of period. Stage, during evolution, exactly. And so that's going to be diminished with heat stress. It's not as you can think of it as, you know, they don't have as, as aggressive of period of involution, but that then delays that proliferation later down the road. And I think that's why we see the responses that we did. We're, we're, if we don't have both of those in play, you won't realize the sort of positive in that next lactation. When you look in the next, la next lactation, they indeed have, as Jeff mentioned, less alveoli, which is the secretory unit of the mammary gland, and those alveoli have less secretory cells, so they just produce less milk. They have less synthetic capacity. So you're setting off that cow for a bad lactation. So Dr. Laporta, can you expand on that? Are they able to, to regrow that the, the, the alveoli or the epithelial tissue for subsequent lactations, or will that impact them for future lactations? We know yet. So for the for the next lactation after the the heat stress during the dry period, they are not able. We do not know in subsequent lactations of the of the dam, uh, but we do know uh, that in the offspring it affects for multiple lactations. But for the dam under heat stress during the dry period, we do know that the first lactation is impacted, but we haven't been able to test multiple lactations. We tried, but uh, we, we just don't, don't have that data. But we've got a little bit of an idea, a don't you think, Anna? So we have, we have the, I think the first three weeks of the second lactation, we see still um, detriments, but we, we just don't have enough uh, cows to, to for sure say that the second lactation of that dam will be impacted. But because cows are old by then and they are leaving the herd. And That's always our problem with our uh, sort of extended sorts of studies where we're trying to track cows through multiple lactations, right? Because yeah. on average, cows last three lactations. So we want to get to that next lactation. We're already two thirds of the way through her productive time yeah. in the herd. And we, most of the times we use multiparous cows. So then by their second mm -hmm. lactation, they, their second uh, all lactation the way through. after, yeah. So what impacts does that late gestation heat stress have on the, on that calf that's born then? Well, I'll start, but I'm going to turn it over to Amena pretty quickly. But, you know, first thing that we observed are all of the typical expected effects on the calf with heat stress, because plenty of people have shown that cows calve earlier when they're heat stressed. A few days earlier, the calves are typically smaller body birth weight. Um, we do know that that extends through weaning. It extends through a year of life in terms of the lower weight in those animals uh, that were from heat stress dams. So there are persistent effects on growth. Uh, we observed uh, that in, in a sort of early summary study uh, that the calves that were born to the heat stress dams have um, poorer survival in the herd and they make less milk in their first lactation um, when they've been heat stressed in utero. So everything else being equal, from the time they hit the ground until the time they calve for the first time two years later, those animals that experience heat stress in utero are going to have about, a again, an 8 to 10 pound a day hit from a milk production standpoint versus her herd mate whose dam was cooled in the next pen over. And so there's there's a lot to that, um, and we're, we're starting to look at that. And Amena actually has now... We've completed a study that, that uh, uh, was looking more at the sort of um, developmental aspects of that that I'm going to let her explain. Yeah, so uh, to add to what Jeff was saying, uh, we just looked at the mammary glands of those 
in utero heat stress heifers versus the utero cool calves. And we saw that their mammary glands are smaller. Um, we, we looked at that as a percentage of body weight and the growth weight of the glands. They are shorter, they are smaller, they have shorter teeth. Uh, and that's not only the growth uh, weights, also the parenchyma tissue is shrinked. And that's not only true for the birth mammary gland, but also at weaning. So eight, eight weeks after, you still see that lag in growth of the mammary gland. And not only the mammary gland, but also certain other, other tissues, such as immune-related tissues, um, stress-related tissues, such as the adrenal gland and other tissues as well. And uh, that's confirming some of the earlier work that Jeff, Jeff has done showing impacts in immune function as well. And when we look at the heifers uh, during their first lactations, uh, we also see detriments in mammary growth. So they have smaller alveoli and less secretory cells as well. So whatever is happening in utero is um, permanent, apparently, not for the first lactation, but also for the second and third lactation of that daughter. So it's uh, pretty impactful. Because, I mean, your summary clearly shows that, right? That the the daughter then in her second lactation makes less milk if she was heat stressed. In her third yeah. lactation, she makes less milk. So it's the gift mm -hmm. that keeps on taking rather than giving. Um, yeah, and if we think they, about it, this is just a 46, well, that's what we target during the dry period, 46 days of in utero heat stress. So whatever is happening in utero, it's changing the morphology and the molecular signature of that mammary gland that will not allow her to produce milk as she should. That's her genetic potential would allow her for. Right. Um, and that remains with her for at three, at least three lactations. That's what we have tracked for. So essentially for her time in the herd, if we go by sort yeah, exactly. of average length of time. Right. And, you know, if you look at survival in the herd, mm -hmm. those heifers do not last as long. It's for a variety of reasons, but... They don't last as long, which is also telling, right? That, yeah, that's sort and, of and the, I, the, the... I think that's, like, that's one of the biggest impacts. I think that you're raising that heifer and she's not even making it to the first lactation. And if she makes it, she's going to produce less milk. So um, it's an animal that you probably don't want in your herd. Well, I, I, I think about... You know, all of the emphasis lately on longevity and how long cows should last in the herd, right? There are certain management things. Sure, there's there's genetic issues as well, but there are certain management interventions that we can make that'll actually extend the length of that cow's time in the herd very simply by making sure that she's not born to a cow that experienced heat stress during her dry period. So, if, you think, if you think about this, it's a multi-generational effect. And this we're talking about 46 days that you can do something to avoid this effect on the cow in the next lactation so you don't lose money and on the calf for at least three, four, five years. So it's, it's, to me, it does look like a good investment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So as a matter of practice, would you guys automatically uh, call calves from cows that were heat stressed if, if you have that option? No, I would cool my dry cow instead. Okay. Well, yeah, of course, but maybe <laughs> if you don't have cooling. Yeah. But, but of course, that, that then leads you to, and you know, we've talked about that. I've had plenty of uh, questions like that, Scott, and it, it makes sense. You know, if I'm in a warmer environment, when do I want calves? you know, for, for replacements. Um, the issue there though is yeah, particularly as we get into larger herds, we're trying to keep a fairly steady flow of animals coming through. And so to say that I don't want the calves that were born as my replacements, um, that were born in August, September, October in a hot environment, um, you know, you, you really start to, to, 
to squeeze down your ability to keep a steady stream of cows going into that herd, calving at an appropriate interval, because you're either going to extend them out or you're going to have cows calving in a little bit earlier than you might like. Um, mm. So there is a lot to that. I mean, it's a great right. practical question, but there's a lot more to it even than than just I'm going to eliminate those calves from the herd. Yeah, and also what Jeff was pointing out in his seminar, it's not about, you know, we, it's not an easy fix. If you would be able to fit, fix this by feeding colostrum, right, that would be an easy okay. fix. We'll keep and you take care of that calf. But it's not that easy. There's something intrinsic to that heifer that will not be wiped away that easily. And we actually try that because that's one question that we often uh, get, you know, can you fix this? Can you revert this? And we try cooling that calf as soon as they hit the ground. And we see that uh, those uh, effects are still there. So we try. We try to fix it. Uh, when we're going to keep trying, but uh, it looks like, you know, those are permanent effects, multi-lightectional and um, that are that stay for, for a long time. So. Mm. That could have been your funny story, Amanda. You could have told them about be. when you when you proposed that study and you asked me what coming. I think would happen. Coming. I said it's not it's not it's not going to happen. It's not gonna, we're not going to be able to do it. Yeah. Oh, I think that maybe maybe no, nah, it's not. And I kept it's insisting like we should do it. We should do it. He's like, yeah, like, let me do it. Okay, do it. Huh. That's how it we work. work. <laughs> It's a little stubborn, let me tell you, now that we're, I have my drink. <laughs> yeah. So, Je Jeff, I'm always curious, how did you get started doing the research in this area, looking looking at cooling the dry cows? So, you might be aware of some of the work that I did previously with lighting and photo period. And uh, yeah. we had found, you know, one of the sort of really interesting observations we made. And I've done a lot of work with dry cows. It seemed like a, it seemed like a fertile area because no one else was working in it. So I didn't have much competition. Um, so we did a study where we exposed cows during the dry period to either long days or short days. And by that, I mean long days, 16 hours of light, eight hours of darkness, the typical photo period we'd have them on for lactation. And then the cows that were in the short days were on eight hours of light, 16 hours of darkness. Real easy to do that in dry cows because you don't have to milk them twice a day and have light exposure and that type of thing. Yeah. And it was pretty shocking uh, when you know, we started summarizing the data from that first experiment because I had expected the animals that were on long days for a number of reasons to actually do better as they went into that next lactation. But it was, it was crystal clear that the cows that were on short days made more milk from the start of lactation. And just like with the heat stress effect, it persists. So we followed that up and looked at, you know, various aspects of metabolism, mammary development, that type of thing, um, and showed that those animals had improved mammary growth. And, you know, the one thing that sort of ties lighting and temperature together is prolactin. So prolactin will increase when animals are on long days. It increases with high temperatures. And while prolactin, you know, when you think about the name, you'd think, oh, well, that would be good. Um, every hormone has a receptor. And so as that increases, what we find is that prolactin sensitivity decreases because the receptor goes down. So long story short, because the sort of mechanisms I thought would might be similar, when I moved to Florida, it was a natural progression um, to start looking at aspects of heat stress in the dry period, just like we had looked previously at, at lighting. Um, now, what is, I think, significantly different first, the prolactin effect may not be the sort of driver uh, for some of these responses, even though that's initially how we got into it, but that's how science works, right? We, we kind of test a hypothesis and just determine whether it's supported or not and move on to the next study. It doesn't mean that the observations of milk production and other effects are wrong, um, but we don't see the same effects in the calves. And part of that is that we don't see the same influences of short days or long days on gestation length and on 
I think, placental function. Because where I really think this is all coming back to is the impact that heat stress has on placental function and how effectively that animal manages the heat stress is to a large extent related to her ability to maintain good placental function. And they just can't do it when they're profoundly heat stressed. And I think that's where we see the effects then on the cow from a mammary growth perspective, but more importantly on the calf. So a long-winded answer, Clay, to your uh, quick question, but that's kind of how it progressed. Yeah. Oh. That was a great question. I'd, I'd ask the same question of Dr. Laporta. How did you get started in uh, whether it's uh, fetal programming or studying heat stress? Yeah, so during my PhD, I was looking at the sort of communication between the mammary gland and the bone and calcium metabolism, serotonin story. Um, and when I started at UF, um, University of Florida, uh, I was well aware of Jeff's work with photoperiod. I, and his work with uh, heat stress was, we were doing that maybe for three, four years by then. And so I got there and we naturally started collaborating, you know, two mammary facilities together. That's what they do, right? So uh, I was fascinated um, when I got there. Uh, I think um, one of your students, she got uh, the very first uh, report showing uh, milk production differences in the daughter. So those in utero heat stress uh, heifers. So that was, to me, was fascinating. I was like, I need to go in this direction. I, I want to know. I was curious. I wanted to understand why. And, and so Jeff uh, and his group, they had a really good model with very consistent phenotypes. And I was all in. <laughs> and Jeff, you know, he, he started collaborating right away. And, and yeah, he just let me dig into those mammary glands and ask my own questions and <laughs> here we are <laughs> so yeah, yeah. very it's productive collaboration topic. yeah it, it, there's such a large number of questions that we want to answer that it's, it's a very fertile area mm -hmm. that we can both share <laughs> yeah and then that led to uh the research that you're now doing at university of wisconsin with the fetal programming yeah yeah so actually when i um I moved in here, I, and this is another funny story, um, Jeff said, why don't you take these 40 heifers that we have? And I said, are you crazy? And yes, I have them here. I just put them in a truck and they are here with me um, in, in, uh, in Wisconsin. Ultimately, so, ultimately, it's all about my right. laziness. I didn't want them. Right. I, she left. Who was going to take care of these? Who was going to keep track of them? I was going to have to do all that. So why that don't you just take them, take them with you? <laughs> so I have them and I'm raising them. So what I'm trying to do here is to generate that second generation. So the F2s and start looking at mammary development in those uh, F2s. We know the, the, the daughters, we, we do have a lot of information on that regard and I'm, I'm going to try to generate the F2 and try to look into those mammary glands and see how these multi-generational effects might, might translate into the daughters, the granddaughters, sorry. Uh, the other thing I'm, I'm working on is calf cooling, which is an area that we often overlook and that's something that, that I have been working on. Um, and it seems to, to, to work, you know, like calves do get heat stress too. They are, um, uh, less impacted or in, in a different way, but we have shown, uh, positive effects of, of cooling calves. So I'm getting creative here in the Midwest and just offering, you know, better ventilation and stuff like that. We don't need to go all the way. Uh, I, I have to remember I'm not in Florida anymore. But, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to mimic the study we did with the thresholds and trying to understand those breakpoints and looking at the different THIs and when those calves get uh, heat stress. And so that's some work that I'm doing here. So, so how do you cause uh, long-term heat stress in Wisconsin? Well, I mean, you still have 50 days. 55, 60 days, depending on how you calculate it, right? Uh, of um, 
uh, high temperature humidity index, um, let's say two months. The the tr the the thing is that you have a lot of cows here, so even if in a short <coughs> period of time you can affect or impact a large number of cows. So in Florida, it's the opposite. You have less cows, but you have this long time, and so the detriments are are huge as well. Um, so yeah, I do think that during those two months, it gets pretty hot here. I forgot <laughs> that, uh, it gets hot here as well. Uh, but I think, you know, there are some intrinsic differences to what the animals are sensing. Of course, uh, at night it gets cooler in Florida. They, they really don't have any time to cool down, uh, <laughs> even at night. No. And so I, I do think that the, effects are, are are much more pronounced uh, but yeah we're, we're going to start comparing those and try to see uh, how relevant heat stress is uh, here but that's a question a lot of people ask me what are you going to do now it's like wh what do you mean what i'm going to do <laughs> <laughs> there's still lots to do there's great research in heat stress coming from canada so that's right yes <laughs> it's not about the geographic location right <laughs> yeah i mean you know, that's the one thing that you see is consistent. And it isn't just in the U.S. You go anywhere in the world and you see seasonal effects. These these play out everywhere. And yeah. part of it may be some of the lighting, but I tend to think a lot more of it is probably these impacts of heat stress. And it's only going to get worse around the world as we go forward. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot left to, to work on. Um, yeah, and we are working on the late uh, gestation, uh, you know, cow and, and calf, but there's a lot of folks doing research in lactating cows, and even like a week, and these short-term events, they, they have a huge impact as well in, in, in the cow, so um, it doesn't have to be long-term to have uh, detrimental effects, it really can have an impact. Yeah, that's going to be no, my next question. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious, right. you know, what kind of research is being done there, right? That the, we're, we're focused on the last two months. What kind of uh, impact is it having on the calf, the fetus, you know, even even around the time of conception? I mean, I don't know if we know or if you guys have looked into we, that. Well, we, we haven't, but there are data out there that show that uh, the, you know, the animals that are heat stressed around the time of conception will have impacts on performance when those animals then are born after they're born calve in um, two years later. Uh, the, you know, the issue is for most cows, that's only going to be an issue their first pregnancy because any other time that they're conceiving, they're probably going to be cooled if they're a lactating cow. I think that we have probably gotten that message out in most places that we need to cool our, our lactating cows. Um, so really, it's a smaller proportion of animals that are potentially going to get heat stressed earlier in gestation. But there are some impacts there as well that people have looked at, at records and, and you know, sort of seasonal effects and that type of thing. Um, those, there are some other studies that have looked at um, reproductive performance based on whether animals were heat stressed in their, you know, first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, and they're consistent with what we observe. It does still seem that the later we heat stress animals, the worse off for that calf. So they can take it a little bit more um, earlier in development. And, you know, you would think that that calf at six to eight weeks before it hits the ground is pretty bulletproof and she's kind of fully developed and everything is there. And now it's just, you know, gain, gaining some weight. Uh, pretty clear that that's not the case. And so we can have some dramatic impacts on those animals' um, development and dramatic impacts for that animal's life. Yeah, so like those early life experiences, like we like... Uh naming that now, uh, it's not just during gestation, it's all also during the first weeks or months, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that you can impact that animal for life. So it's this, this uh, transition period of the calf that it's, it, it's really important in, in setting uh, them up for, for a good start. It's, it's not just uh, later, it's, it's even very early on. 
Yeah. I, as I recall during the presentation, one of the, the, the big impacts was on the animal's immune uh, system, both the, the cow and the calf. C can you expound, uh, one of you, on, on the impact on the immune system uh, and, and what you've learned in some of your studies? Go on, Jeff. You have done more in that area. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the first aha was when we just took um, IG, IgG samples from calves first day of life through through weaning or through a month, I guess, of life and uh, saw just dramatic differences between the calves that had been heat stressed and the calves that had uh, come from cooled dams. So first thought was, oh, well, we've we've really messed up colostrogenesis in these heat stressed cows. There's there's an impact there and eh, not so much. So the effect on colostrogenesis is, all, is one on volume. It's not one on sort of IG content, and typically it's not one enough of one on volume that it would limit how much we have. I mean, you occasionally get those cows, but in general, it's not that much of an effect. Um, but there are certainly other factors in the colostrum that may influence their ability to take up the IG from the colostrum. And that's what we started working on. Was it an effect on the cow or was uh, the calf or was it an effect on the the colostrum itself. And it doesn't appear to be that when we heat stress the cow, her colostrum is impacted enough to affect the calf. But it looks like that heat stress in utero limits the amount of or the capacity for absorption of immunoglobulins. And what it appears is that those calves that are born to heat stress dams, either because they're not as mature or because it's been accelerated, their gut closure process is already ramped up when they're born. And we've got a study that will be coming out in JDS Communications here in the next month or two that shows that, that the calves that were born to the heat stress dams have a much accelerated rate of, of gut closure relative to the calves that were born to cool dams. So, the problem with that, of course, is it doesn't matter then how much colostrum we put into them, they're, they, they just aren't going to be able to overcome that. And then that leads to some of the sort of downstream impacts on immune status in those animals and their ability to survive in the herd. Wow. Is there a, is there a difference in, in placental weight in these, hmm. in these animals? Yeah. Uh, the best answer to that is yes, but it's variable. But I can tell you, we, we, I think, did a reasonable job of placental collection in our study last summer. And we looked at total weight, um, maybe see some differences there where we really see it is in the number of cotyledons. Okay. And if you go to a presentation at ADSA this summer, you'll uh, be able to see that visually uh, in terms, not just numbers, but the, the size. So it seems like the, the animals that are heat stressed have fewer cotyledons and they're increased in size. Now, you know, my limited understanding of uh, placental development and placentation is that they kind of start out with the number of cotyledons are going to have kind of early in pregnancy and then they develop. So either the heat stress is causing those animals to lose cotyledons more rapidly um, or there's something else at, at play there, but it does seem like there is less capacity for, and we know this, I mean, from other species, that there's less capacity for nutrient and oxygen transport in those animals that are heat stress versus the ones that are cooled. And and it makes perfect sense that you might have more of a, a a radiative effect in the calves in the cows that are heat stressed versus the animals that are cooled because they're just trying to deal with getting rid of that heat. And it almost and so looked the, like they fused together, like those those yeah, cotyledons, and they because they were big. Yeah. The the individual yeah. cotyledons are bigger as well, and yeah. so that may be what yeah. it is. It's more of a it's more of a, a, a response in order to move heat away from that developing fetus rather than supply nutrients. Obviously, it's not one or the other, but 
if you're thinking about it as a seesaw, right, we're leaning towards getting rid of heat versus supplying nutrients. And our uh, more recent work now is going to be looking at methylation signatures of those uh, mm -hmm. cotyledons and seeing uh, what what they are, what they want to tell us, and we're going to dig into those methylation and genes. And what's what's causing the, the the shorter gestation length then, and these heat stress? That's stamps? a million dollar question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Um... So it's kind of like when I said that the, you know, the gut closure, is it because she's born a little bit less mature or is it because we're actively sort of moving? Um, it's, it's more of a, a acceleration of maturation process. And I, I guess we, we don't know. Um, but I would say that there's likely an interaction from both the calf side and the dam side of that heat stress. And you're probably seeing some impacts um, related to maintenance of pregnancy from the dam's perspective, but also then the calf is kind of signaling that this needs to be I'm going to take Over. my chances outside rather than in. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm done. I'm done. I want out. <laughs> Time to get out of here. <laughs> exactly. I'm pretty sure that the temperature is uh, at a peak and I'm done. And, and the other thing to add there is that um, the, the the temperature, the fetal temperature is, is pretty much controlled or, uh, by the cow. Uh, the, the calf have lo, uh, no ability to control its own temperature. And so it, it, it's important to keep that in mind. Oh. So if the cow is heat stressed, uh, and, and it, this is hard to show in cows. Uh, we, we know this from other species, goats and sheep uh, experiments that have actually tested that. So. Yeah, and it's one, of the, it's one of the features of this sort of programming effect that, to me, it's more of a, um, a normal range insult than some of the things we can do nutritionally or otherwise, because even a, a cold stress cow, right? She's going to, and I get that question too. What about cold stress? Will that impact? Well, I don't think cows are going to get cold stress very easily. If we're going to cold stress a cow that's pregnant, she's probably got other factors that are, you know, she's nutritionally deficient. She's got some other things going on. And so it's more of a pathology rather than this, which is kind of part and parcel of normal physiology and how that animal responds because nutritionally she's always going to favor that fetus but from a heat stress perspective she might favor she might want to favor him but there's no way she can right the physics just don't allow it and so she can shunt nutrients towards the fetus at her own disadvantage but she can't there's only so much heat she can shunt out of that and get rid of that and that's all going to be less controllable by the dam so where do we go from here? What's next uh, for both of you in terms of uh, areas of study, at least related uh, to this? And, and maybe not. Maybe you've got some other areas you're looking at as well. Uh, Dr. Laporta, where are you headed next? I am very interested in looking at, you know, methylation effects and, and, and how heat stress in utero, um, how we can explain these um, different phenotypes two, three, four, five years later. I'm very interested in, in understanding that from a molecular standpoint. Um, and uh, the calf, I'm very interested in that early life period in the calf, uh, how we can set them up for a good start, even if it's in utero or during that pre-weaning period that we often don't think about much. Uh, but I think we're now trying, we're understanding that that, that period of life is quite important in setting them up uh, for um, successful lactation. So those are areas that I'm, I'm actively working on uh, right now. That uh, So we're going to have a lot of overlap in terms of our areas of interest and sort of things that, that we do. Um, I, too, am interested in um, what's happening in that calf, but sort of mechanistically particularly from a placental function standpoint, how we can overcome this. Are there ways that we can alter effects on the calf, for example, if we see and we've seen already differences in methylation patterns, which are going to affect gene expression down the road. 
can we alter that nutritionally or otherwise um, in the animal? Maybe we can't overcome the effect in the cow, but we can certainly overcome some of the impacts on the calf. Um, so some of those sorts of questions in terms of interventions that can allow us to deal with this, because right now we have a very effective way to deal with it, which is cooling the cows, but you know, mm. it takes water, it takes energy. Uh, there's a lot of, it, it works extremely well and we know how to do it properly, but you know, there's going to be limitations down the road. And so if we can in, you know, other environments adjust this, and overcome some of these negative in impacts. I think that's kind of where we're headed. The other, the other area that we've got an interest in is, again, from some of these samples that we've collected from the calves that were um, that that we sacrificed in this last study to look at mammary growth. Um, we also took samples for microbiome analysis. So looking at how we might be affecting those animals' digestive microbiome in particular early in life and then how does that set them up later on for differences in feed efficiency or productivity um, that might explain some of this. Um, I kind of, um, I probably have a similar sort of response that I did to the cooling of the calves. Mm -hmm. and I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of effect, but it, it, it's an interesting thing to look at and it may be that there's that interaction between tissue development and microbiome establishment that then leads to one phenotype or the other. Because again, I come back to the fact that this is not an outside of the normal range insult. What we have with the heat stress phenotype of the calves or of the cows is that they're not fully expressing the genetic potential that they have relative to the animals that are cooled, but it's not a pathology. It's just within that normal range, we're pushing them to the bottom and the other animals are allowed to fully express what they're seeing. So it may be a combination of a number of factors that are allowing for that expression of the improved phenotype. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to that note, Jeff, um, and we have talked about this many times, obviously we're sort of mammary gland centered, uh, but also we have find out that a lot of other tissues and organ systems within the animal are impacted. It's not all about the mammary gland. Obviously, for a successful lactation, you need a functioning liver uh, and, and other organs, obviously. Um, so even like in these heifers that we euthanize, we see smaller adrenal glands. So there's a whole story with the HPA axis and how they regulate stress uh, in a way. And so those areas are also uh, very important. And obviously, heat stress is the center, but you know other stressors cows are pregnant for a heck of a lot of time during their <laughs> lactation. So there are many other uh, times mm -hmm. that that cow will be stressed. Uh, and I do think that it's, um, it's about um, relieving those stressors to the cow. If the cows are going to produce milk, they are made for that. Uh, it's our job to try to uh, reduce those stressors and let her do what she knows how to do. So. Mm. Excellent. You both have made a very compelling case that we need to cool those dry cows. Um, although cooling systems are not free, right? They're, uh, they're, they can be expensive. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the economics of, of cooling cattle and, and where does it make sense or perhaps where it doesn't make sense? Well, I'm going to show my bias, but you know, I used to get asked when we first started doing this work, I can only cool one group of cows. I can only invest in this. Who do I cool? And for a few years, I would hedge and say, ah, oh, probably your early lactation cows and then the dry cows. And then I've, I've come off of that completely based on some of the economic analyses that we've done, right? The, the first group of cows to, to cool are the dry cows, because not only are you going to have an impact on her entire next lactation, but you're going to have an impact on the calf that she's carrying for her three, first three lactations. And so when you think about the amount that it would cost you to cool your dry cows effectively, essentially one sixth of your herd versus the entire herd, that's going to, I think, pay off a lot sooner than even cooling. And I know it's heresy, the early lactation cows. Um, you know, I, Obviously, um, 
I'm extreme there, but I also think that asking the question that, you know, I can only cool one group of my cows is not the right way to frame the question. Can I I afford not to cool all my cows? I think it's about understanding too that heat stress. I think this is the take home for me is that uh, heat stress does not only impact lactating cows. And if it does, it's not permanent. They will recover. Uh, and what we're seeing here are permanent effects that are very mm-hmm. hard to overcome. And so it's not about who do we pull. It's about, and Jeff can speak more to this, uh, uh, what do you have in place to pull your cows? And what right. would make more sense depending on your facilities and your resources? And then just figure out what's best for you. Uh, but yeah, they they did a lot of work on that, and our our last um, paper in JDS showed that when you add the losses that you have on those three lactations of the daughter, just the numbers go off the roof. And yeah, it, it's all our estimations, right? But uh, it, it it just makes sense. So uh, we're getting close to the end here. Stephanie just uh, called last call. Uh, just want to make sure that there's not any uh, big issues, big last topics call. we haven't covered last time. You've got a lot left. <laughs> One more round, Steph. Another Cheers. red beer. Oh, yeah, Jeff, Jeff you're, you're in the <laughs> Clay, it's time to refill. <laughs> it, it no is. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Are, are, are there any big issues that we've yet to cover um, for the audience? I'm going to throw a dart here. Um, we didn't talk about the, the granddaughters too much, but um, if we add that into the equation, uh, the, you know, it's, it's the impact is really, really amazing. And we don't, we don't have, we have preliminary data showing that the survival and Jeff showed some of those graphs uh, in his webinar. Um, mm-hmm. We have less and less animals. We're talking about six years after the initial insult. But we do see, and I was surprised, and, and, and I remember sharing this with Jeff, and we were like, yep, they produce less milk, even like mm. five, six years down the road. So it's, it's amazing, and, and it's really intriguing. So, Yeah, to me, the sort of take home is that it's two programming events. That heat stress, latent gestation is programming that cow to be less productive and potentially less healthy as she moves into that next lactation. She can recover from that. I think that we see some subtle effects, but I think that she'll recover in that next lactation if she's appropriately cool. The calf is programmed as well, but she is programmed not only to be less capable of surviving in the herd, but also to produce less milk. And then she's going to transfer that lower capacity onto her offspring. And so, you know, we've got one that might be recoverable in the cow, but the dramatic effects are in those calves. And that's really where we're going to see a hit long term. Excellent. Well, Jimena and Jeff, I uh, want to thank you uh, for this important conversation and for sharing your new ideas and, and new data with us. And of course, Clay, thank you for all the help and, and being here tonight. And thank you to our loyal listeners for stopping by at the exchange to sit with us a while. If you like what you heard, please remember to drop us a five-star rating on your way out. And remember, you get uh, a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt just by hitting the like button or the subscribe button and sending us a screenshot along with your address, the size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Our scientific conversations continue on the Real Science Lecture Series webinars. Visit balchemanh.com slash realscience to see upcoming events and past topics. We hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Cheers, everybody. Thanks. (laughs) Cheers. Thank you. you.